Welcome back to the You Can Too podcast. On today's show, we have Darren Prince on the show. Darren Prince is a international international best selling author of his memoir Aiming High. He is a prominent sports and celebrity agent of many people that you probably know: Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Jerry West, Dominique Wilkins, so many more. And for those who may not be aware of who you are, Darren, can you give us a brief overview of? your story, because I'm really excited to jump into what got you to this point to where you are today. So I started uh, my agency in 1994. Thank you for the intro, by the way. I, I was a young entrepreneur at 14. I had a baseball card company long before the internet ever existed. I, I kind of compared to what the sneakerhead craze is about. Yeah. I built that company at 19. I started booking autograph signings for iconic athletes and celebrities. And I sold that company in 1994. And I started with Magic Johnson as my first client, still is to this day. Yeah. Spoke to him two hours ago. He's finishing up his European trip in Greece and uh, was all over Europe. And I think uh, just the one superpower that I've always had is relationship building and vulnerability. When you look at my, my personal stories and my personal struggles, uh, I was a very high-end functioning opiate drug addict for about 24 years of my life, uh, long into the agency business until I hit my bottom and turned it into a brand new beginning. And it started so young for you. And I know that it started out of whether it was anxiety or it was a lack of self-worth. It was a, a, it didn't fit in kind of, where, where did it stem from within you? Where, where do you think that that, that, where did you think that it became prominent for you? I think it was everything you just said and then some. I I was always uh, verbally teased for being in special ed classrooms. I didn't speak up about it. Um, my mother and father gave me all the love in the world. My mother made me too much love uh, to the point where I was a mama's boy. So anytime I was away, there was a lot of anxiety, physical ailments. And the first time I experienced anything like that, which was just crippling anxiety, was at sleepaway camp at 14. And um, again, only feeling comfortable around my parents and trying to fit in, not having that comfortable in my own skin. I had terrible stomach pains one night. I went to see the nurse and she gave me this green liquid for the pain. And I felt like Superman. All those inadequacies went away and I felt as good as everybody else, if not better. And without even thinking about it, every night for the next three weeks, I went back to that nurse to take whatever that green liquid was, uh, later finding out that it was liquid Demerol back in uh, 1984. So anything that was opiate based um, was so euphoric to my system. And uh, I just wanted more and more of it. Were you aware of what you were? Of course, you weren't fully aware of what you were doing at the time, but you were 14 years old at sleepaway camp. Like, were you aware that every single night what it was doing to you, what that was going to, you weren't aware of what that was going to lead to, but were you aware of like what that was doing to you? No, because, you know, if you're feeling insecure, if you don't feel good about yourself and you're able to just walk across the softball field with the counter and get this green liquid in a mm -hmm. uh, cough syrup cup and go back and feel like everything you wanted to be, who's going to tell a 14 year old you can't do that anymore? And then, um, you know, fast forward when I came back from sleepaway camp, I had my wisdom teeth removed and my mother was given these white pills and again, having no idea what they were, but that same feeling came back from those white pills that the dentist gave her. And I later found out they were extra strength Vicodin. And now I started making money. So when I'm 15, 16 years old, I had resources to get anything that I wanted. And I started learning uh, what opiates were, you know, Percocet, Oxycontins, Vicodins. And uh, just did what I had to do to get him until eventually uh, I started my agency. Now I had all the credibility in the world mm -hmm. and uh, it's just evolving. So anybody in your audience that listens and if you think you're putting something into your system just to fit in, I'm lucky to be alive because uh, around 23, 24, all well, the doctors were giving me anything I needed. You know, it's kind of hard to say no to somebody that's representing you know, Magic Johnson and Pamela Anderson and Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, they just figured out, like I said, sciatica, physical pain, and uh, gave me everything I needed. Yeah. And at such a young age, 14, 15, you're making three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 a year. The external, everyone's looking at you like you're you're everything you're probably there like there's probably parts of you like during your day where I am everything and then there's other parts of the day where I'm nothing like that those feelings those emotions those 
where where before you got into the drugs and everything happened that's where those emotions start to pop up again like how did that where where was your internal narrative at that time i feel like there was had to be a counterbalance of of both kind of like fighting or, or what was that like well, I, I would say for probably the first five or ten years man and i know you, you probably have a young audience so i always need to be careful when i speak especially a younger generation because it worked i mean i did yeah. not think one time that i had a problem i didn't think one time <clears throat> these pills that i'm putting into my system are making me uh, turn into something that I always needed to be. And, and again, having money, clout, recognition, power within my field, um, nobody was going to tell me otherwise. It's, um, it, it's, a, it's a very strange situation because I'm feeding off of the false narrative of what everybody thinks Darren Prince, that kid in the small classrooms that would never make it all of a sudden is on talk shows and the biggest newspapers and being interviewed and around the biggest stars. So for me, it was almost continuous validation um, of a false sense of self-esteem. And um, I got wrapped up in it too. There was absolutely nothing I couldn't do when I was high on opiates. And uh, from networking with the biggest people in the world to creating business opportunities. Now, on the business front, I neglected quite a few things. I remember my accountants calling me on taxes and returns and different filings because I was so hyper-focused on the image of Darren Prince and the ego of Darren Prince that I wasn't giving them enough time uh, to really sit down and go over the volumes of income and money that were coming in and, and to really set it up uh, at a much more sophisticated, uh, scaled business at that time because, like I said, I was living off the hype myself. So why, why would I need to? There's plenty of money. You guys take care of whatever the tax is. I don't want to know about this stuff. Um, you know, and that's when I speak to high school kids. <clears throat> yeah, if I would have paid attention, uh, there probably would have been, well, not probably, a, a million percent would have been a lot bigger opportunities during those early days that I missed out on because I was so caught up in the false narrative uh, uh, of the image of Darren Prince, the facade of Darren Prince. And um, Eventually, it just turned on me. And I remember the day that it turned into kryptonite. I was with smoking Joe Frazier. May he rest in peace. And we were at an event in Dallas, Texas. And I remember just going to his room. Uh, I did my usual. I tried snorting a couple you know, Oxycontin or Percocets. And usually within 20, 30 minutes, I would get that buzz. And it, it wasn't there. It was the first time. Nothing. And I remember I, I did another one and nothing. And I was like, what the heck is going on? We're like, these pills bad or something. I never from that day on for the following six or seven years ever experienced that feeling again. Now was at the point where I was doing it, doing and taking anything I can put into my system, not to go into detox, not to withdraw, to, you know, change my thought patterns, the way that I felt, whatever it is that I needed to do to kind of get out of the sense of self. What do you think you were running away from at the time growing up and, and where do you think that you were trying to get to? Because I think whether it's a, a lack of a lack of confidence or a, a sense of insecurity, I think so many of us, especially just growing up in general, we're trying to figure out who we are, where we fit in the world, um, what we want to do with our lives. We're all trying to figure out how um, we really fit in the world. And, and I think when that does and when we're, we're lacking clarity on what that looks like, a lot of those thoughts can come up. but where do you feel like you specifically, where do you feel that that, that came in for you? And, and, and how do you think that um, that played out for you? Well, my, my situation is very unusual. Jay Shedd is a dear friend. And when I was on his podcast, he was even like, wow, like you made it. And you're looking yeah. backwards at all the people and the naysayers and all the haters. You know, here I am and I got to the top. Yeah. But for whatever reason, I always felt like, you know, I had to look backwards because, you know, when you're in those developmental years, it's why I'm so passionate when I speak, especially to young an audience. And you don't you don't speak up mm -hmm. about people verbally teasing you, people uh, making you feel less than not feeling a part of, um, you know, broken self-esteem because of that, not feeling comfortable in your own skin. That goes into your core. It goes somewhere. And when you're not releasing it and talking about it, there's no healing. So even though I arrived externally in that space, internally, I was, you know, still a, me uh, a mess. I'm so glad that you bring that up because I think 
especially in, in the world that we live in, I think, and, and that's why uh, such a big reason I wanted to, to, to bring you on the show and was so inspired by your story was you achieved everything that you could possibly think of by the time, I mean, 19 years old, you sold your company for a million dollars and everything that, that you could think that you could possibly want in the external that you, you, you'd accomplished by 14, let alone 19 years old. And that, that's all you needed. You could have retired by then and just lived off that if you wanted to and just decided to stop. And, and you proceeded to move on to the next thing and the next thing. And you had such a, 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 in, in, in a measurable uh, a work ethic at such a young age. Where do you think that that stemmed from? And, and why do you think that you had such an amazing work ethic? That, that came from my dad. I mean, it all came from my dad, um, who passed away in 2017. He, him and I, I remember um, Elliot Lovey was an intro to business teacher and the tennis coach at our high school in Livingston. And um, so actually, I believe in the Tennis Hall of Fame, incredible multiple state championships. And it was a mentor to me. It was the one teacher that fully got me. And an in intro to business, it was the only A I ever got. And I remember... In his intro to business class, he challenged everybody to go, to go home and create a business. And I, in my own mind, had Baseball Card City as a business. Even though I didn't have a plan, my dad then challenged me to go out and execute on that plan. And all my friends were into dating and going out at that point. And I could care less about girls. So like three or four odd jobs, I'd buy everybody's baseball card collection. I accumulated an incredible you know, value of a collection. It was you know, upwards of $10,000. So... My dad, when he challenged me and I showed him about this baseball card show and it would cost this for a table and I could buy, sell and trade. I think his creative genius from being in the direct mail coupon advertising business just rubbed off on me. And he he gave me so many incredible lessons, not only at that age, but, uh, you know, up to, you know, the, his later years in life that he sat down with me and he goes, look, you're not what everybody else has in school. And that's OK. Because there's something with your brain that I've noticed that works so differently than everybody else. It was almost like Rain Man with numbers and statistics and studying things. That's what we need to zone in on. Because if we can accelerate there, you're going to be unstoppable. And hearing that from a father at that age was just groundbreaking and life-changing to know that I had his support and he instilled the confidence in me that I can do this. And so many life lessons that your reputation is the hardest thing to uphold. You only get one chance at it. Um, he would say, it's not what you say, it's what you do. The idea is 1% carrying it through is the other 99%. You're young, you're going to see, James, a lot of people have all these ideas and they all talk, but who executes? I learned to execute. I still execute to this day. And that came from my father. Yeah, absolutely. And, and with everything that you've executed on, to to now be able to look back, like you said, what do you feel that you wish you knew earlier on, both in the personal and professional mm -hmm. aspect of things that would have helped you on earlier on? Um, on the business front, I think it would have, I think I would have loved to appreciate money, money more mm. and, and how difficult it actually is for most to accumulate wealth. Yeah. Um, because I never truly valued it. And that was always my father's biggest concern at that age. And I still struggle to this day with it, with being so free and taking care of so many people where I think it's just something where I like money. I like nice things. Now that I'm in a place of fully recovered, I'm more about peace, happiness, serenity, and self-love and be able to look in the mirror and love the person that I see every single day and that I continue to strive to be and improve upon my character defects but now at 53 i look back sometimes it's like you know if i just did this differently or that differently um i think it also stems from a need of validation i think um through the years always needing to be that savior for people that are struggling is something that i've always put first and foremost even in recovery above my own needs whether it's my family my co-workers uh, people that work with me um i've always just wanted to make sure other people are happy, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. But I remember long before my dad passed to my uncle, Stu, who passed away a couple of years ago, he, he was in recovery as well. A big reason I got it, got sober. He used to tell me, he goes, look, there's nothing wrong with putting yourself first. Because the bottom line, if you put yourself first and you get yourself to a place that where you need to be, it's a lot easier to then take care of other people. 
And uh, I think if there was a good course on financial literacy, I would have been the perfect candidate to learn about it because when it's thrown at you at such a young age and it's so easy, very difficult to really fully appreciate. Like I would have weekends where my dad would call me when I had Prince Mark in a group and he was alive and he'd be like, oh, where are you going? I'm like, oh, I got to go somewhere. We have, we have this event with this client or that one. He goes, oh, what do you make? And I'm like, ah, it's, it's all right. We're making like 25000 for the two days. It's a lot of work. And he'd be like, do you have any idea what it takes for the average person? Two days, you're working two, three hours a day and you come back within 36 hours to make that type of money. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. I mean, literally almost up to the day that he passed away, that was always a struggle because this was a hard working man that built everything up from the, fr- from the bottom to the top in his profession and just, you know, knew that there was always a disconnect with me. So if there's one big, I don't want to say regret because now thankfully Prince Mark and groups at a place where it's as big as it's ever been. And we have some huge partnerships getting ready to announce, be announced and, uh, clients and revenue streams you've never had before. So I know I could kind of reprogram my thought process on that to, to help others too, because it's not an easy situation. It's a blessing and a curse for people that are young now that can go on TikTok and all of a sudden post some videos before you know what they're making thirty, forty thousand dollars a month. They don't want to go to college. They don't listen to their parents. They have no mm-hmm. discipline. They want to go out and pop bottles and go to strip clubs and live the life on private jets and yachts and None of that really ultimately makes you happy at the end of the day, unless you're happy within. Mm-hmm. There had to be a part of it where, like, I, at least I see the flip side of it, where there's the there's the part of it where that instant uh, amount of of income where it feels almost instant. It feels like it's it's almost easy to some extent because it it just happens so quick. But then there's also the other part of it where um, life is abundant, and you have to take that that mindset towards it. Was there something that was instilled within you or there's something that you want to instill into others, whether it's when you're speaking or when you go on podcasts that you that you talk about a lot to help others? Because I think there's a lot of people in a position where they do believe that it's only hard work that's going to get you to that next level or it's only there's only one way to kind of get to wherever we're trying to get to. That abundance isn't um, for me. It's only for a certain amount of uh, or only certain kind of person. Uh, what What do you tell them to help them realize that? there is another way there is a, a different path if that makes sense i think it's a combination of both i think you have to be good within yourself i was saying i was always a good person but i was a sick person and i think yeah. it took me uh to get to my bottom to realize that that you know it's it's a combination truly of both don't let your external success define who you are of course everybody loves validation it's great to feel important. It's great to feel needed, but try to get, you know, the insides to line up with, uh, you know, the exterior. I was finally able to do that on this spiritual sober journey, but it took me a while to get there. Yeah. And, and so there's so much to your story because at 14, you're making 400, 500,000 at 16 you're you're around the same place then 19 you sold it for about a million and i think about 19 or about 23 was when you were about a million in debt correct Uh, about 20 yeah about 23 it happened 23 24 so from 19 to 24 you went from about a million dollars you just sold to a million in debt and it's insane to see because as you just said two minutes ago prince marketing groups at the best that it's ever been at and so you've been able to pivot in so many different directions and so many different um, positions and whether it's um, in baseball cards and your marketing group and agency and in multiple different ways. How do you think you've been able to pivot so well, especially in that time? And then also even now. I think you got to learn from the losses. And um, I know I'm also in a business where there's a lot of people on the other side that have their own motives. So I just think as you evolved in the sports and entertainment business, you're very mindful of who you're surrounding yourself with about people that are team players and want the best for all first ones that are very one side and it's all about them. And um, I just think staying true to my superpower, which is the art of relationship building. Any client, if they were on here with you, would tell you it's all about the love and the respect and the family bond and 
I mean, Magic and I end every call. Hulk Hogan and I end every call. Ric Flair and I end every single call with I love you. Carmen Electra, same thing. Charlie Sheen. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just beautiful to to kind of have that. And I think I'm, I'm a big believer in manifestation and energy. And I think just when you put the right energy out and you're doing something, um, when it's not just purely money driven, I just think that's why we're in the position we're in right now at 53, that the company and the agency itself is in a better position than it's ever been. And I'm able to learn from my losses as well to really not make them again. And the key is to surround yourself with people that are where you're trying to get to so you can learn off of their years of mistakes and save yourself a ton of time and money. And you can just gravitate towards what they do to become successful. Yeah. So at that time, I know Magic was like kind of helping you use his notoriety to build your business at the time. Yep. And so was that kind of the the thing that helped you kind of skyrocket from that moment? Or what was the outside of the relationships and how, how, how have you been able to build relationships so well? Because, I mean, there's not many people doing what you've been able to do for such a long period of time and at the level that you've been able to do it. At for such a long period of yeah, time. Yeah, so so what happened was, as I talked about in my book, uh, in the memorabilia business, I was investigated. There was a big fraud scheme yep. going on with Michael Jordan autographs, and not knowingly, I was selling a lot of product and investigated by the FBI and um, got in a bunch of trouble, not for knowingly, but I, I, I didn't disclose everything I needed to to them, thinking that the person that was selling to me all these products that were authenticated by a former FBI forensic document expert um, was doing the right thing. And a lot of people went to prison. I didn't. Mine was just more probation, um, ignorance. And because of it, my dad always told me about reputation. So what I wound up doing was sent out refund letters to as many people as possible, got myself into a hole on top of it, probably didn't stop my living expenses, didn't dial things down because I had this image to uphold at the same time in my ego. And, and that's eventually what I got myself into such a hole financially. And then my father challenged me on a fly fishing trip in Alaska. I took him with the last three grand I had to my name. He didn't want me to spend the money, but that trip changed my life because he looks at me because what's your next move? And I told him I wanted to be an agent, but I don't have eight years to go to law school. And he said words I'll never forget. Why do you need to be a lawyer? Like that's a myth. Like life is about who you know, not what you know. The fact that you have a relationship with Chevy Chase and Magic and Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, just start with Magic. Tell him your vision. And a few weeks later, I was in East Lansing, Michigan with him for an event. Uh, we headed up to, uh, I think, around the Detroit area by Gibraltar. Uh, it was an iconic flea market that's no longer there. And we had time in his hotel suite beforehand. And he just asked me, and I told him what my vision was uh, because he said, what's your next move? And he's like, look, I love you. You made a mistake. I love your family. I know all about making mistakes. You're going to make lemonade out of lemons. And I will give you two years to represent me. But if you don't use me to knock down every door to build your agency, you're not going to make it to the end of the two years because life is about not how successful I become. It's how successful I can make you and everybody else around me. It's a domino effect. So remember to pay it forward when you get back on your feet. And that's always been my MO because literally every client I was working with and then some was signing with Prince Mark and Uker because Magic Johnson gave me the ability to utilize his name. Mm. I don't remember who who said it, but it's the, the quote that you're going to get what you want in life by helping enough other people get what they want in life. And it's yep. like Magic gave you that ability to do that. And so you did that for enough other people and you got that for your... And, it's so profound because now you're doing that in multiple different areas. You're not just to, just doing that for um, networking, but also doing it for your book in multiple different areas and so many different levels. And I'm I'm so prof like just profound to see your story and how you've got to where you are today. And I'm just blown away by everything that you've been able to do. I know that there was a moment. Was it All Star Weekend? I think it was 2007 with Dennis Rodman. Can you break in down in Las Vegas? Yeah. Can you break down that moment and how that was a massive so, pivot? In yeah. Your life? So, so we were out there celebrating a TV show deal that we did with Mark Cuban's HDNet TV called Geek to Freak. And 
Steve Simon, who I go back with since I was 10, he's the vice president of Prince Marketing Group now. We had a big event at a club, and um, I just woke up with a terrible case of bronchitis and called uh, the doctor uh, to the room for a house call, and he gave my um, he gave me a prescription for Percocet, Tussian X cough syrup, which is a very heavily based uh, opiate cough syrup and some antibiotic. I was married at the time, went to the pharmacy to pick it up, uh, called my wife on the way, my then wife, and I said, do me a favor, what are my three Baca Rebel and Cranberries? I'm going to get ready to go out. And I finished half the bottle, chopped up some pills, a couple drinks, and within five minutes, man, it was a feeling that, you know, haunts me to this day when I think about it, because I fell to the ground, I was foaming at the mouth, my heart felt like it was palpitating out of my chest. And I just said, I, you know, God, I'll never do this again. I don't know what I did. Don't take me. She freaked out, called the paramedics who came up with, you know, oxygen mask on my face, needles in my arm, EKG machine everywhere, uh, going crazy with the heart rate. And um, I never made it out that night. But I woke up at three in the morning, and I looked at myself, my eyes were bloodshot, I'd bag under my eyes, I looked like I was probably in my 60s, and just so beaten up and defeated. And I looked to myself in the mirror, and I'm like, you sick bastard, who, who, who does this? Like, how do you, how do you live like this, knowing you're out here for a celebration, you have so much going on. And with that, I, I chopped up a few more of the painkillers, and I snorted them, and I drank the rest of the cough syrup, and I got back into bed. And you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, because in my sick brain, it was the Baca rebel and cranberries that caused the reaction. So you know, it was the following week, I finally had some accountability. I called an addiction psychiatrist. He put me on Suboxone, which was an opiate blocker. But I wasn't honest with him. I was sniffing Ambien at night. I was still drinking a little bit here and there. I was on, you know, anxiety medications, a mood stabilizer. And I lived that way for another year until the date of July 2nd came 2008. And that's when my bottom turned to my brand new beginning, holding the last of my opiates and screaming out to God, take the money, take the business, take the notoriety. I need a single day of freedom. If you take me out of hell, I promise I will take one person out of hell each and every day, um, you know, to show them an incredible life if you give one to me. And it was like a lightning bolt. I had a white light moment in the bathroom of the Carillon apartment building in New York City, and uh, I heard a voice say, I've got you and you're ready. And 30 minutes later, man, I'm in a 12-step meeting in a church basement with 150, 200 addicts and alcoholics who are once of a hopeless state of mind. And I threw my hands up completely accountable. I said, I'm suicidal. I need your guys' help. I'm an addict. The first time in my life, that room on July 2nd, 2008, I just celebrated 15 years. Those people I didn't even know made me felt a part of. They finally made me feel something known as identification. I knew the way they were talking about the way they felt when they were on drugs or when they were drinking versus how they felt when they weren't. Everything they were saying was resonating with me. It wasn't about, you know, magic and smoke and Joe and Ali and Hulk or any of the clients. This was life and death. And I, I finally felt like I found a home where I was understood. And I just became immersed in this incredible spiritual fellowship and still am to this day. And one day at a time became a month, became six months, became a year. And my big brother, who I refer to as my sponsor, but he really is my big brother, Steve Delaval, said to me after I got to a year, you want to keep this gift, you better start giving it away to other people. So that that's first and foremost in my life. There's not a day that goes by where I'm not trying to help somebody with mental health and substance abuse issues through scholarshipping people through my Aiming High Foundation that can't afford it um, to give them, you know, a, a brand new life uh, the summer I was given one. And uh, that's just first and foremost. I, I've, I've been blessed to, you know, be on borrowed time because by all rights, I definitely should not be here. I know God kept me here for a reason and I kept my promise because one day at a time, I continue to take people out of hell. Because it's not just about that person, it's about their loved ones, their family, their friends, their co-workers, their children. To be able to get that person back, uh, you know, broken soul and all healed, accountable, working through whatever the root cause was that caused that reckless, selfish behavior. So you can finally have, you know, a life beyond your wildest dreams. I probably listened to five to ten podcasts that you were on from five years ago to a year ago. And you telling that story still gives me chills right now. 
um, because you, you mean that so much. And I just want to appreciate you and so much for saying that and just sharing your story again and again and again, because it's so Thank true. You. Thank you. Um, I'd love for you to dive through the, the five A's that you talk about, because it kind of, it's like <clears throat> kind of walking, walking through that is that's essentially what the next steps were, it seems. Yeah. And those five A's were for anybody in life, you know, attitude, adjustment, accountability, acceptance, and action. I mean, I learned them in the fellowship, but there's not a human out there that can't benefit from every single one of those, you know, um, whether you have an eating issue, whether it's some other substance or behavioral patterns that you're acting out and, you know, you don't like energetically where it's taking you or you feel stagnant because of it. And, you know, I put those five A's into my heart, into my soul. I still do them. I'm still flawed. I still screwed up. I still make mistakes. I still have a thought process at times that I know is very reminiscent of a degenerate freaking drug addict. And I want to evolve and become better each and every day. And yeah, I might fall back here and there, but I know how to reel myself back in and get back onto that spiritual beam and know that I'm human and know that I'm so much better than I've ever been. It's kind of like, you know, I said it on Jay. It was one of the most profound statements he said was, when I look back and I say, I'm not exactly who I want to be. I'm not yet where I want to be, but thank you, God, I'm not the person I used to be. And it's about being vulnerable and accountable and not blaming a single person. I don't care how horrific of a situation that you were putting growing up or during a relationship or a job or something. We make those choices to either heal and evolve or to let whatever that horrendous situation did define us to make choices that were not in line with who we were meant to be. Absolutely. From whether it was when you were 14 years old or uh, because when you were 14, people could have blamed uh, the person that, that gave you it at sleepaway camp. And you didn't allow that to be the, 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 the catalyst. reason. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And when you were 21 and for, <clears throat> I think for six months, you got arrested four times within yep. a six months period. That wasn't anyone's fault, but yours. Right. And, and everyone has to be able to take the accountability within themselves to recognize that it, it is all, it's always on ourselves, whether it's, um, whatever problem it comes down to, where do you feel that the the first step is for anyone to overcome any problem really in life? To, honestly, don't point the blame at other people. Do you know it's stupid now when I look back and say, well, addiction ran in my mother's family or there was always painkillers in the house mm -hmm. from different surgeries and stuff she had or, well, these kids, you know, were all verbally te teasing me. Eventually, many of them started working for me. So they went yeah. from calling me an idiot to calling me boss. So that shouldn't have been, you know, an issue either. You know, I chose to put something in my system uh, to fit in. Um, you know what? I got too much love for my mother and that caused anxiety. You know how ridiculous that sounds? Yeah. You know, yeah, it could have been a portion of that created anxiety that I had, but I never spoke up. I didn't speak to anybody about it. You know, I, I, I had guidance counselors. I had my parents, I had teachers, I had friends. I plenty of outlets to say, I don't like the way I'm feeling and I'm doing something now to make me feel a lot better. And I don't like what it's doing to me because it's changing my personality. I didn't do that. And then, you know, I get sucked into the middle and the forefront of the sports and entertainment business representing the most iconic stars over the past hundred years, but well, I'm going to slow down now. No, I mean, now more than ever, uh, I'm uncomfortable and I needed, I needed to have something into my system to fit in because again, I never addressed it. I never spoke up and I buried it and I was living this facade. Yeah. Yeah. That I think for many people, I don't think many people can relate to that, that extreme, but I think a lot of people can relate to that 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 feeling of of not feeling like they have control and in 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 the feeling of not having control and even where you're at now like how do you counterbalance that feeling of not having control of not going back of uh, of that feeling what do you result to or wh wh where do you go <clears throat> i mean i still keep in touch with a lot of my spiritual brothers and sisters i do my meetings four or five days a week i do interviews like this i you know hope and pray that each and every one i do which they have has gotten you know, quite a few people from around the world messaging me about something that I said. I yeah. think just staying in a place of service and being vulnerable and continuously telling my story and speaking all over the country as often as I can, 
uh, that almost just makes me bulletproof to it. Because if I get complacent and I stop doing this, it's real easy to have a built in forgetter and start convincing myself that, um, you know, you know what, maybe it could be different this time because I have a disease that tells me I don't have a disease. Mm. And that's what addiction and alcoholism and substance abuse is. It convinces us that it will be different this time. And I'm not afraid of relapsing and dying. I tell people I'm afraid of relapsing and living because that that's, that's the real hell. And I've seen too many people with a lot of time complacency, not continuously, you know, pushing the message out. They're helping people when they have the opportunity, they go back out. They've never come back. And, um, not going to let that happen to me today. Yeah. When, when you started even, and I think for many, and I could be wrong on this, I'd love your perspective. Was it because you couldn't get your brain to like turn off? Was it like trying to find that stillness? Was it trying to find, I know that it was like, like, like courage, of course, it was the, the, the confidence that wasn't, that was trying to come out. But was it also like trying to stop your, your brain to some extent or because I know I listened to the Jay Shetty podcast and there was a part of it where there was some kind of extent to that. But what was it specifically that that came came out for you? Yeah, I mean, I had, you know, just a hyperactive brain attention yeah. deficit disorder and to just reel it in and stay focused. My drug of choice ultimately were opiates that just gave me that more chilled, relaxed, hyper focused sense of euphoria. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, I did all the illegal drugs in the world, coke and, you know, ecstasy, all that stuff growing up, but none of it really, you know, would have allowed me to function the way that opiates did. And, um, I, I just, like I said, it, it took me probably six or seven years, but was once living to use turned out to using to live. And I don't know exactly when it turned or what happened that night at that event with smoke and Joe, but, um, I lost my superpowers. And I was chasing that feeling for years and years again and couldn't reclaim it. I think for so many of us, especially now that like phone, <clears throat> I know for me growing up with a phone, it, it's made, I mean, our screen times are insane at this point and oh, always going on your phone, always having something to look at, always taking in something over the overstimulation is disgusting. I think at this point and taking time to be with your thoughts, to be with yourself is something that I think we don't prioritize nearly enough. So n now where you're at, knowing that that was a, a prominent hurdle for you in, in the younger ages, what do you do now? Or what have you done over the years to make that a priority to um, continue to reinforce that ability to be able to sit with yourself and continue to build your relationship with yourself as you as you grow? I do self improvement more than anybody I know. I mean, even my office, my friends, my work colleagues, I have a spiritual healer, um, flying in tonight from Austin, Texas, uh, my boy Lingerie, just to uh, get some time with him. I mean, it's really is to be like 99% of the people in those books to talk about their problems, to take a pill, to go back to the doctor, get the same prescription again and again and again. Well, that's a band-aid. Yeah. You know, David Goggins is a dear friend and client. And like you said, unless you are prepared to go to effing war with yourself, you will never come out of that freaking dark place. You will just live, you will coexist. And that's not me. I want to continuously go, you know, deep into the woods and find out even sober, why some choices, why character defects, why behavioral patterns, why thought processes come in and go back into whether it's childhood trauma or moments that have happened to continue to clear that out. Because otherwise, what's the point of being sober? You know, and what's the point of helping people if I'm hypocritical myself and not working on, uh, you know, my own self and uh, my own issues that character defects are few and far between right now, but there's still some that are there. I mean, everybody I know in recovery, the, the, they battle them. Uh, we, we laugh that, you know, we can't get that instant gratification. And when I got a bunch of spiritual brothers that are very overweight and they're like, I can't just have a scoop of ice cream. I eat a freaking two pints of ice cream on a Sunday afternoon. Like it's freaking three bottles of vodka. Well, I mean, that's a character defect. The same thing. You have to figure out why, okay, you're not going to die or go to prison from eating too much ice cream. But at the end of the day, you're still not going to have a good quality life. If that's happening several times a freaking week. If you're eating too much candy, everybody knows sugar is toxic. Sugar is highly addictive. And I've had plenty of days where even three weeks ago, my girl Carla in the office knows, I mean, I, 
perfect breakfast, perfect lunch, grilled chicken, uh, egg omelet with avocado. And then for whatever reason, I was like, okay, I'm going to get a healthy pizza. It was cauliflower pizza, but it was a disaster the rest of the night. For some reason, it was Taco Bell, it was ice cream, it was candy. And uh, I'm literally going to bed praying like usual. I said, okay, you're entitled to have this once in a while. Don't do it again next week. You know, you're human. You know, you, you, you want to be the same exact addictive behavior, James. It went from one thing to the next. And once that switch is off, you're not telling me to have a piece of grilled salmon after having a pizza and some ice cream and some candy. It's just very difficult for somebody like me to turn that off. And I think most people can identify with that. Jay said it himself. Everybody has an addiction to something. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I think most people can associate with that kind of perspective on something, especially I think most of my audience is, uh, is entrepreneurs or are high achievers in that way. And we have an, uh, uh, an obsessive and a, a, a really obsessive personality, I would say. And for, like you said, you, someone's coming out from Austin right now, but I think for a lot of people, we don't, a, a lot of people don't have the the resources as as though you do. So for those that maybe don't have the resources to reach out to maybe uh, the people that are healers or whoever it may look like, like yeah. what would you say for those that I, are in that? Look, I'm glad you brought that up because I tell people all the time, even on my 12-step meetings, I shared about my healer and people know my relationship with Jay and Lewis Howes and yeah. all these incredible guys that have become my own spiritual <laughs> brothers from their journey. Um, go to YouTube. Yeah. Look up every Jay Shetty interview. Look up Tony Robbins. Look up Lewis Howes. There's so many people out there. If you like the higher end, hyped up breakthrough type of speakers, my boy David Goggins. There's E.T., Eric Thomas. You know, you do not have to have a dollar to invest in it. Uh, my girl Nutza from American Idol uh, from Georgia. She's from the country Georgia. She's incredible at 26 years old. I mean, we laughed about a couple little blockages, but she basically was from a small country in Georgia and lived on YouTube, watching interviews, learning about people, behavioral patterns. She knew that she could have gone sideways on her life and instead developed this incredible talent. And uh, she's going to be the next breakout superstar. She already was on American Idol this year. Her talent is incredible, but the human being that she is at 26 is so far advanced with her character, her moral compass, her thought process, her positivity, because she educated herself instead of watching people on TikTok, which, yeah, she still does, yeah. but nourished her brain and changed her thought process to stay on that positive mindset was watching so many people she looked up to, watch their interviews, watch their tutorials, watch uh, you know what they speak about. If there's something you're suffering with trauma-wise, you can go on YouTube and literally find that with anybody you know, put in specifically in that search and so when people is like oh i don't have the resources to get a healer or to be around a jay shetty you don't need it there's a reason everybody has a ton of content on the internet and all you got to do is watch it my boy dave melter is another one that pushes out there omar the rockstar i got so many of them uh you, you know it, it, it's uh you know, there's no reason why you just can't follow somebody on Instagram. Joel Olstein is a good friend. I mean, if you like it with a little bit of a religious, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, component to it, it's free. Yeah, it's free. But when you're waking up in the morning and you're watching uh, whatever else on, you know, certain athletes or, you know, personal fitness, which is good and great, or what cars people are driving, like, Jordan Harbaugh is another one of my boys. I mean, these are all the biggest guys in the space. Yeah. You know, start following every one of those guys that I told you about. So when you wake up in the morning, if you're trying to create change, if you're trying to create a mindset shift, those five or six individuals, their tutorials or their videos that day is going to be the first thing put into your brain. And you do that consistently for 30, 45, 60 days and you start taking an action on some of it, you will have a psychic change that your entire life will evolve for the better. Couldn't agree more. I was speaking with Dave uh, yesterday and it's it, when you surround yourself with the people like the, this, is why I do the podcast, I surround myself with people like you and uh, it's a shortcut. And, and if I can provide value to other people as well, it's, it's, it's a plus. And there's so, there's so much to, to gain from, from, from this kind of stuff because. Yeah. And I get, and I gave him the thrill of his a thrill of a lifetime. Uh, 
we call each other Joel mates. I was able to bring them to sit front. I don't know if you told you this story, sit front row with Joel Olstein at Lakewood. We call it Jews for Joel. And we went with Hulk Hogan about three, four years ago, and it was on his bucket list. So we got to spend time with Joel and his amazing life, Victoria. And I insisted that he took a day trip in and he did it as busy as he is. And to this day, we're like bonded at the hip over me making that happen for him because, you know, I tell people you always need to listen to the religious component of what Joel preaches, whether to the Bible, there's so many incredible spiritual messages on mindset and healing and what you could do to get yourself into that place of, uh, you know, recovery from whatever it is that you're struggling with. Yeah. Whether it's in the, the side of healing or, or manifestation, I know you said you believe in that a lot. And I know like David is someone that's in a lot in that space. What do you think has been like the lesson that's taken you the longest to learn in, in that kind of area of life or just in general? I mean, I think, I think somebody has to be ready. It's the biggest key. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of people in my life that aren't ready, no matter what I preach, no matter how I talk to them, they could see the way that I'm living physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Yeah. It, it's to each their own. You know, you can't drag somebody to their bottom. It, it's they have to do it on their own time. You know, you can guide them and make suggestions, but ultimately the follow up is up to them. Like my dad said, the idea is one percent. Carrying it through is the other ninety nine. So. You know, I have so many people in my life that care about me so much that are doing nothing to help themselves. That's the craziest thing. Nothing. Zero. I don't, I, there's, I mean, I'm not talking one, two, I'm talking a lot of people that are so proud and so happy with where I'm at and they love to see me happy. But I wish every single one of them could find the joy, peace, and happiness and serenity that I have in my life, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I can feel that because I and if I, I could had, just um, touch every single one of them and say, look, I'll struggle today. I'll struggle tomorrow. Yeah. Let you just feel for this moment, even with the highs and lows, business ups and down, health issues, whatever, what it's like to truly be in a place of peace, love, freedom, happiness. It's the greatest thing in the world. You know, I, I pray every single night before I go to bed. I do something in the world of recovery every single day to stay connected. There's not a day that's gone on in the last 15 years where somebody's not reaching out for me. I dealt with it with two different people this morning on Instagram, you know, that are struggling. I hit some guy right between the eyeballs because I didn't care. He's still struggling. He's got a month sober, doesn't understand about going to a 12 step fellowship, finding that bond. Yeah. I told him, I said, look, you know, you can keep asking me or telling me what to do. You have zero shot because right now you're doing something called white knuckling it. You read my book, right? Get your ass to a freaking meeting and then tell me you're going to still feel like you're white knuckling after a week. I was like, it's that simple. Otherwise, you know, message me after your next relapse because I don't care. This is life and death. I'm going to tell you what works for me if you ask, and I'm going to tell you what works for the masses if you ask. And um, again, it's not even drug addiction or substance abuse. If you're in a place where there's trauma, where there's whatever it might need to be that needs to come to surface from whatever root cause, I I can tell you there too. But hey, if you're not going to do it, I'm good one way or the other. I want everybody to get to a place of peace and happiness and healing. Yeah, I'm I'm right with you on that. And I think it's, it's, um, it's a hard, it's a hard truth to come to. Because I think I, I see a lot of people where I, I jumped into this space, so I think probably over two years ago, crazy to think about. And my life has dramatically changed from the person that I am to the the life that I live, to the work that I do, to the people that I surround myself with. And uh, people have seen the changes that I've made in myself as well. And um, you can't make anyone change unless they want to see. They, no, it's they, amazing they you're to. doing that at your age. Yeah, at your age, what you're doing is incredible. I mean, you probably have no idea the impact you're having on so many that, you know, sometimes they're just not comfortable reaching out and telling you what you've done for them. But, you know, this entire generation of people that you're touching and helping a lot more than you know to not become the next Aaron Prince. I really appreciate that. Was was there a a mindset shift or a uh, a realization that you you made much too late? No, I mean, I I could, you know, I could stay in that space, um, you know, and say, uh, you know, the, the, the company should have been in a different position right now. Like I could have had, you know, 
attained much greater wealth and taking care of so many other people if I had my, my mindset or focus on that. But I've also come to grips with everything worked out exactly perfect the way that God wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. That one little belief that could have gone differently. Um, you know, I might not be in the position I am right now. And, and Magic called about a big uh, partnership that we're working on this morning. We spoke for three minutes on that. And five, ten minutes was about where the business is right now, looking at some opportunities that, to no fault our own, didn't happen that allowed me to kind of change my thought process on where the business is at to position us now to have some incredible strategic partnerships that normally I never would have recognized. And, and even that was a blessing. Um, there were some huge opportunities that would have meant, you know, substantial seven figures to us last year that kind of went sideways. And uh, he was laughing this morning with me and just said, boy, he goes, you got it. He goes, God does it in a certain way. And, and it's going to be a blessing because, you know, it's very easy for certain people when they have that success to get complacent. And, and the fact that you realize I'm 53, there's a lot of people you want to continuously get to take care of. I've never been somebody that understood scaling a business and exiting. I've got two of my boys now that are coming on as my partners. Uh, that's all they've done, you know, upwards of substantial nine figure exits. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if a year ago or 10 months ago, these opportunities came App came around for me, I wouldn't have thought about doing this ever. Never. I would have just been that same old, you know, business is great. I'm happy with where I am. So I think everything happens for a reason. I believe that as well. The, the last question I ask every guest is it encapsulates what I'm trying to do with this podcast. And I think, um, I think you may align with it. I think a lot of life is uh, unlearning more than it is learning. And I think uh, we have to unlearn a lot of the beliefs about ourselves or the beliefs about the world that don't serve us, that hold us back from creating a, a more fulfilling life that uh, we are able to access, that we hold ourselves back from achieving. And the, the question I ask is, what belief are you currently unlearning? What belief am I unlearning? That's, that's a good one. Um, that I'm unlearning. I mean, I think the, the, the one thing that I fully accomplished um, when I look in the mirror is I have zero insecurities zero and that was like the hardest thing for me to uh learn and a little bit of unlearning um but i also know that there are still some unresolved issues within myself that um i have to learn and unlearn the behavioral patterns on how to shift them and how to tweak them because it's not helping me uh manifest and energetically get to a level that I need to get to. But I, I think a lot of it is just ultimately recognizing it. And the fact that I'm blessed to have so many people in my inner circle that are in that healing space yeah. to, to kind of put their pulse on it. Um, Cause I can wake up any given day thinking I've got the greatest life in the world and I'm exactly where I need to be and everything's perfect, but no, no, nobody is. You know, you, you get complacent even on the self healing front. That's not a good situation either. Everybody always has something that they're going through. There's character defects that we all have, and uh, you know, I want to continuously work on them and be vulnerable and talk about it. Ninety-nine percent of the people are living in a, in, a, in a in a world of look at me on the outside, and they want everybody to think it's great. I don't really give a shit. I'm going to tell you when I'm not feeling good and when I screwed up and what's going on because that's what's made me feel self-love, made me feel secure. Um, doing esteemable acts to help people is what's given me the self-esteem. And I think that's why people gravitate to my interviews and my speeches and my posts so much, because I just say it like it is. I don't really care. This is me. This is where I'm at. You know, I had a bad day in New York three weeks ago. I was with Newt, so I was just off, and she was there doing a lot of press, and I had to go to a 12-step meeting. I posted it. I don't need people to think my whole life is about celebrities and recovery and great interviews and keynotes and what I don't. I said, tough day. I had to get out of sense of self and go back to my roots. And I had so many people DMing, are you okay, bro? What's happening? I'm ready. I'm fine. This is life. I'm having an off day. And I know what I need to do is go back to basics when that happens and go where, you know, life started for me 15 years ago, which is in a clubhouse with a room of drunks and degenerate drug addicts to remind me who I really am and then get into a place of gratitude to remind me how far I've come. Yeah. Your story is so powerful, Darren. I can't express my gratitude enough for you, for you coming on the show. Um, your book, for those that need to, to need to see it, it, it will definitely be in the show notes. Can't express my gratitude enough for you coming on the show, Darren. Thank you.
Thanks, man. I appreciate you nailed it right on one hour. Good job.